So this um, passage that invites us into a space of deep refuge and part of tonight's theme of renewal. Uh, what, what I like to actually call perpetual renewal because when we are abiding in a place that is mindful and present and at ease ultimately in simplicity, in ultimate simplicity, effortlessness in abiding in this way, that the present becomes an eternal experience. It becomes that which we encounter to be the truth of every moment, that the present is eternal. And when we remember, when we remember this present, this presence of the present, our own presence within the present, we are uh, in what we can call a state of perpetual renewal, meaning that it is an effortless freshness in life that is so easy to forget, so easy to lose. So how mindfulness, how dharma, how practice can actually help us re uh, basically be reminded of this space, this refuge for renewal, and in this case, refuge not being an escape from anything, but on the contrary, a much more heightened engagement with which we attend to our deepest intentions on the path. Yeah? So often it can feel as if what we're doing is creating a refuge apart from the world or to escape something. And not that there's anything wrong with seeking uh, a safe space in which um, in which we, we can feel as if we can just sort of let go um, in a safe way. But also here that refuge also means uh, a place of renewal and cultivation, a place to attend to all things internal, to attend to our, the energy of our lives and to fully embody the present and possibly embody the teachings along this path that we're on. So, so for tonight, what I thought we would do is see how, if some of you have been in this place of busyness, maybe it's been a joyful weekend. Maybe you've had a lot of activity, a lot of family. Um, maybe you've been protesting. I hear there were some magnificent protests in Plymouth on Thursday. <laughs> so wherever, wherever you have been, um, you know, it may have been quite active. Maybe it was restful. Either way, uh, I think this is a good chance to sort of look ahead, perhaps, while we're trying to be present <laughs> and looking ahead at things like Advent, Hanukkah, Christmas, the solstice, perhaps uh, the winter itself. Maybe it's none of those other things, but just the winter. And uh, in all of kind of the social energy, the relational energy that some of us may need to begin navigating the holidays um, as well as well into New Year. So uh, I think this is a good chance here to pause. Yeah. To pause and exercise agency, exercise an aspect of choice in changing what we can call the causes and conditions of our own exhaustion. This is sometimes feeling extraordinarily helpless with that when we're on the go, perhaps. Uh, all of this happens in a space of refuge. <clears throat> so there is a Tibetan word, tendrel, uh, tendrel which means uh, literally, it means causes and conditions. It means uh, uh, the interdependence of things as they arise. And um, these are things largely that can feel as if they're out of our control. For example, um, you know, you sit down and you think, great, I've got a free afternoon. Um, 
I'm going to focus on writing. Well, if you're me, it'll be maybe focusing on music or writing or, or practice. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you get a text and there's an emergency. <laughs> I had no control over this. Uh, and it's something you, you are really called to attend to. So all of a sudden we go from a space, uh, a place of spaciousness to a place of effort, of engagement, of, uh, of being back uh, in this active state, much like uh, the form of green Tara in Tibetan Buddhism. Green Tara is the bodhisattva of boundless compassion. She is that refuge of protection when we encounter suffering. And if you ever see pictures of her, sometimes her foot is, is placed on the ground. She's not in full Padmasana, right, the lotus posture. But one of her feet is generally, if she's in a seated position, is uh, on the floor. Sometimes her hand is here. You can see her just sort of casually um, seated in such a way. And the reason her foot is on the floor is because she is at the ready. She is ready to spring into action. She's ready to come to us in this beautiful form of the divine uh, mothering feminine energy that protects, protects us when we are in suffering and brings us this boundless form of compassion and, uh, and guidance as well. And with white Tara, the white Tara is another form of Tara who is there uh, to bring us a sense of renewal, if you will, longevity. Uh, longevity, not just long life, but, uh, you know, I, some of you know, I teach at the Extension School course at Harvard, course on mindfulness, meaning, and resilience. And we talk a lot about resilience. I feel as if resili uh, resilience is really another quality of White Tara. She's training us how to be um, responsive and energized right? and continue to find endurance in our lives. So yes, she's there also for a spiritual guidance when we're confused or we need discernment, when we encounter suffering and the mind gets cloudy. So anyway, the green and white Tara are manifestations of the tears of Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of great compassion who uh, basically weeps for us when we suffer and out of his tears come green Tara out of the uh, right eye and white Tara out of the left. So it's a lovely, lovely image. So all of these um, figures are largely qualities we embody. And these are qualities that we have within us that are so easy to kind of lose sight of. This is why these images, when we practice with, with Tara in whatever form, uh, first we visualize her or really any deity in Vajrayana Buddhism above us, radiating light, taking that light into ourselves, into the heart, ultimately dissolving that being into white light, taking her into ourselves, flowing that through the body, and then we become Tara. We embody Tara. What we're doing is activating the energy and the love, the compassion, the radiance of Tara, all of her qualities, qualities we already have within us. We're just opening them. Yeah. So another form of what we can call refuge. And intentional, being intentional. Being intentional. Now, part of this is, you know, we are sort of in, instructed and encouraged to have compassion, um, boundless, <laughs> boundless compassion. And there is this very strange term called compassion fatigue. Actually, and some of you, I know Cliff, you're nodding as a, as a priest. <laughs> My father, who was a Lutheran preacher, um, he, uh, I think he reveled in his compassion fatigue because he never seemed to be tired of getting tired of people. <laughs> he constantly was attending and visiting and there, there was largely, the family was a part of his congregation. So we were lucky to be part of that, that Sangha, if you will. <laughs> so uh, I'm not making fun of him. He was a very lovely man, but um, in any case, um, here's the thing, if we need renewal, and we've been attending to so many others. 
we may feel this thing that we call compassion fatigue, but ultimately there is no such thing as compassion fatigue. And I, I can hear it now. The therapists on this call are like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. What, are you kidding? Yeah, no, I'm not kidding. Compassion is not fatiguing. Compassion in its purest form is energizing. It is exquisite. And it fills us with vibrant energy, with vitality. So why do we get exhausted? It's not the compassion that's the problem. What is fatiguing us? It's all that we bring into the compassion. That is not compassion. It's the expectations. It's the worry. It's the resistance. It's the wounded healer. Yeah. It's the part of us that needs to see an outcome when we're being of benefit or, or striving to be of benefit. It's the part of us that fears death if we're going to the bedside in a, with a compassionate motivation to someone who is dying. You know, it's all the other stuff. There is, uh, there is something called empathic distress, which that is a real thing. Yeah? We take on the suffering of others, but we don't have the tools to bear it. And this is why in, in Buddhist training, we learn how do we hold suffering, first our own, own suffering. So we train with that and then the suffering of others. So, so that's one of the reasons why I bring up this compassion fatigue is because, uh, especially this time of year, I know several of you are in the caring professions and, uh, you know, it's easy this time of year to be, uh, you know, offering counseling or ministry or chaplaincy, um, medical attending to uh, medical to patients in the medical field and so on and getting tired and then we have these holidays and we keep giving giving out giving out i'm one of them it comes naturally and yet compassion itself isn't the problem you can feel like it is so i often think about how one thought one sort of notion that's helpful is that to be a compassionate person is like being a candle and a candle can light another candle and loses nothing. Candle lights another candle, loses nothing, doesn't lose energy. It's the room gets brighter. And this is the nature of compassion, to be simply self-evident in an uncomplicated way. You know, this is the underlying nature of the good heart of who we are when it's free from all of the baggage and all of the stuff that we carry, all the samsara. Yeah. So noticing, first and foremost, if you've been putting out a lot of energy and you're exhausted from that, love is not the problem. Compassion is not the problem. That is the energizing quality. But inquire, where is all my energy going? Where is it right now for you? Where is your energy now? Where is it going? Maybe, maybe it's in a good place. Maybe you're feeling what we call right effort in Buddhism, just a perfect balance, this impeccable sort of abiding of energy that's not being overextended. It's also, you're not falling asleep. Yeah. You just sort of here, yeah, and open and relaxed, present. So this question of choice is whatever causes and conditions have led to feeling depleted. Often we may feel engaged, we may feel joy. We may be uh, energized by all of the things. Stress isn't just about bad things, right? It can also be joyful things. And then when we stop, what happens? All the air goes out of the tire and we crash, we check out. Yeah? We're going from one extreme to the other. So part of what, um, what can be helpful in this notion of perpetual renewal or the eternal present that is always fresh when there is no striving and no trying, but simply abiding and being responsive in a mindful way. This is, of course, the ideal in our practice. Yeah? It doesn't mean we can do it all the time. 
but it's always available, even if we don't take advantage of the situation. And so this is where choice comes in, seeing that the causes that lead to our exhaustion, the, this notion of tendril or pratit samutpada in Sanskrit, the 12 links of, of dependent arising causes and conditions, all things are there because of so many other things, yeah? Rather, letting go of the effort. Moving from effort to exhaustion, also letting go of the things, of all that immense amount of energy that goes into holding our thoughts together, that goes into reactions internally to what we experience. After all, we live in an environment of active energy in our lives. Things are moving very quickly. Things are shifting and changing. So refuge here, things begin to settle, a place to embody the present in simplicity. Um, there's one other term I'm going to send your way here. And that is in Buddhism, we have this concept of the bhavanga, bhavanga citta. Bhavanga is that aspect of awareness that is full potentiality for realizing the essence of mind. Bhavanga is this quality that we can also call ground of becoming. The ground of becoming, this luminous, subtlest aspect of awareness in which all things abide, all potentiality is there. It's the motivational tendencies to awaken. You know? And it's that aspect that impels us to realize the essence of mind as bright, as awareness, as open, pure, clear awareness. Bhavanga citta, extraordinary, and yet so natural extraordinary in what it offers us when we release into that quality. We're going to practice this in a moment. And so part of this is relinquishing the density, the negativity, the overstimulation on the other end, the sensory, the need for stimulation, for sensory pleasures to feel some kind of aliveness back. You know, what we might call hedonic, uh, kind of qualities as opposed to what the Greeks called eudaimonic or eudaimonia, this quality of inner flourishing, of joy, of well-being that doesn't depend on external stimulus, but rather comes from what we bring to the world in a, in a good way, that our flourishing depends on those around us flourishing too. So we're really talking here about non-duality. We're talking about equanimity as part of that refuge, so that we're not bouncing between the density and the spaciness, the negativity and the hyper stimulus of hedonic needs. Not that there's anything wrong with a piece of chocolate one now and then. <laughs> yeah, we're watching a good movie that's stimulating. I'm not saying we don't do that. Buddhism doesn't say don't do those things. Just know that they're utterly passing, they're ephemeral. Don't get hooked on them, yeah? And so here at the, at the center of all of this, this wellspring of vitality, this source of what uh, the yoga tradition calls ojas. Ojas is this quality of uh, life force that abides in the subtle body, at the coil at the base of the spine, the essence of kundalini. Extremely energizing. A lot of vitality in that. And this is what will be activated. We're going to begin with the spinal breath practice tonight. Um, so basically, these are, these are um, snapshots, I guess, of things, one of which may resonate with you around uh, the stress, the our directed mind, this energy that is being pushed into the world that we so badly need to reclaim for our renewal and the reminders that renewal is much closer than we imagine it to be. We just have to let go. <laughs> 